Okay, the uh, skyscraper curse is something that came to my attention in 1999 when Andrew Lawrence, a financial analyst, wrote about it, and it was reported on in all the major financial media. And the financial media was kind of skeptical of this notion that somehow the building of a world record-setting skyscraper would cause a world economic crisis. It sounds really far-fetched, and it, it actually is um, pretty far-fetched in a very specific regard. But I was fascinated by it because I could see through Mr. Lawrence's report and see Austrian economics at work, to see the Austrian business cycle theory at work. So I could, in a sense, see through the workings of this strange correlation that he was reporting on. He didn't really have any reason for it. He considered it, you know, it might be just random luck. It could be something in financial markets. Uh, but he didn't come to any conclusion. So I started working on this and developing a theory of connecting the building of the world's tallest building to world economic crises using Austrian uh, business cycle theory, uh, using Cantillon effects, named after Richard Cantil Cantillon, who I was also working on as a history of economic thought project. So it was just these two projects sort of coinciding. Um, and I eventually published, I tried to publish this paper in some mainstream economic journals, but there were no equations, there were no regressions or anything like that, so they didn't really want to have anything to do with it. So I eventually published it in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics in 2005 in the spring issue. And I'd encourage you to take a look at that um, particular paper because it will have most of what I'm going to be talking about here today in it. So what is this skyscraper curse? First of all, it's focused in on world record-setting high skyscrapers in terms of livable space. And that's important um, for driving this model. The record setters are begun during a boom, an extended boom period of artificially low interest rates. And the buildings that represent the curse typically are completed and open to the general public during a period of economic crises. So these are special cases. This doesn't happen very often. So we've had just a, um, a small subset of these economic crises related to buildings, although real estate is typically involved in all business cycles. Okay, so there's always uh, real estate problems in the economic bust, uh, but these are significant economic crises. So we have, around the turn of the century, the Singer building. The Singer company made sewing machines. The MetLife building sold insurance. Um, they were begun in uh, 1905 and 1906. Then there was the panic of 1907, just as these buildings were setting new records. And then they opened in 1908 and 1909. Then there was the Woolworth building in 1913. And this was a case that Lawrence said was the exception to the rule because there, were, there was no economic crisis. And does anybody know, not you, but does anybody else know why there was no economic crises with the Woolworth building setting a new record in 1913? Yes, sir. Uh, World War I. World War I. Okay. I've asked that question in the past, and no one's actually come up with the answer. So good job. Um, prior to the completion of the Woolworth building, the American economy went into one of the worst recessions that it had ever experienced. 
But very quickly, because Europe was at war with itself, all the major European powers uh, began a, a war in 1914, so they were buying military equipment, metal, weapons, and so forth. And that dragged the U.S. economy out of that very bad recession. So it really wasn't an exception to the skyscraper curse. And then uh, we had the Great Depression, 40 Wall Street, which is now the Trump Building, the Chrysler Building, which is now part of Columbia University, and the Empire State Building. Were all begun prior to the stock market crash in 1929, and they were finished in late 1929, 1930, and early 1931. So there was a, another grouping or cluster of record-setting uh, buildings. Um, in the early 1970s, you have the World Trade Towers and the Sears Building in Chicago. Uh, those were begun in the late 1960s. They set the new records in the early 1970s. And they opened um, in 72 to 73. And, of course, that was the beginning of a more than decade-long um, economic crisis in the United States and elsewhere. It's often referred to the stagflation of the 1970s. But it's something that saw, well, for example, uh, there was a severe recession in early uh, 1970s, uh, we, we, it was so bad that we actually went off the gold standard because of it. Wage and price controls were imposed um, in 1971. Uh, there was all sorts of economic problems in the 1970s, and that continued on until the early 1980s when unemployment was over 10 percent, interest rates were over 15 percent. And then, um, again, there's, there's more record buildings here in Asia, the uh, Asian financial crisis and the Petronas Towers, the uh, tech stock bubble in Taipei 101 in Taiwan, um, the housing bubble and the financial crisis in 2007-2008, the Burj Khalifa Tower was opened in Dubai, setting a world record, and uh, the record was set in 2007, right before the onset of the uh, world financial crisis. Uh, we have a European record in the Shard Building in London, and uh, it set the record, uh, started in 2009, set when everything was just fine, of course, in, in the European economy. But when it set the record in 2012, of course, you had the European debt crisis, the pigs crisis, where you have, you know, a third of the countries of Western Europe uh, facing uh, a very severe debt crisis. And of course, unemployment rates exceeding 10%. In some cases, as high as 25%. So today, they're building a new world record setting skyscraper in the deserts of Saudi Arabia, north of Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. The uh, Kingdom Tower is projected to be an entire kilometer tall. However, the top 400 feet is just for show, basically. So it's only going to exceed the Burj Khalifa Tower by about less, less than a dozen stories. But it will set a new world's record. So in anticipation of that, it's scheduled to open in 2020, so it should be setting the record maybe in 2017-18 range. So how do we get the linkage from the skyscraper curse to the Austrian theory of the business cycle? Well, the Austrian theory of the business cycle is dependent upon low interest rates, artificially reduced interest rates. Okay, that's the driving force that fools entrepreneurs into making the wrong kind of investments in the economy or male investments in the economy. So that's the engine that's driving this whole phenomenon. And in the skyscraper curse, 
The only difference between the skyscraper curse and the normal business cycle is that interest rates are held low for an extended period of time and well below what would be market determined interest rates. So the central bank determined interest rate is lower than what would occur if it was completely market driven. So these artificial interest rates have three influences on business and entrepreneurs, and ultimately this is gonna create the skyscraper curse. The first effect is on interest rates and land prices. When interest rates are artificially low, this has it, the effect of raising the price of land in the economy, particularly in large metropolitan areas. So why is that the case? Well, say to yourself, if you had a property that you think is worth about $100,000 and interest rates are one half of 1%, or in the case of my savings account, one one hundredth percent. So when interest rates are very low, the idea of selling your property and then putting the money in the bank is not a really great alternative. So you're more reluctant to sell than if interest rates were 10%, so that if you put the money in the bank, you would be earning an income of $10,000 a year. So all of a sudden, with high interest rates, uh, you're more willing to sell. And so that puts a downward pressure on land prices when the interest rates are very, very low, people are reluctant to sell their land, and so the price of land goes up. What does that have? In it? What kind of effect does that have? Well, if land prices are very high, then developers, whether you're building skyscrapers or whatever, if you're building houses, it doesn't matter what you're building. If land prices are higher, you're going to want to put, you're going to have to put more square feet of usable space onto that property in order to make it profitable. So if Mama Goldberg's very valuable piece of land over here, um, if you were to buy that property and tear it down and to build something on it, well, I'd, I'd estimate that they'd probably charge you over a million dollars for that piece of land. So any new developer would be have an incentive to build not just one story, but maybe three or four stories on that piece of property. And if you look around Auburn right now, what you'll notice is a lot of construction. And all the new construction is all higher in terms of being taller than the old construction. There's one building in, in downtown Auburn on College Street um, it's, I think, five stories high, and it's a white building, and there's retail on the first floor, and then there's apartments on the, the remaining floors. That was built in 2007 during the housing bubble, and that's the, really the tallest building outside of the university in this area. And, but now they're building multiple four- and five-story buildings throughout the downtown Auburn area. So interest rates are low. Developers want to develop, but because the price of land is so high, they're building taller. The second effect is the effect of the interest rate, and in this case a low interest rate, on the size of firms in an economy. When interest rates are very low, what you see uh, on Wall Street is lots of mergers and acquisitions of small companies becoming larger companies through mergers, acquisitions, or simply just expanding the firm itself through investment. So what does that do? Well, larger companies require more centralized services. So if you look at an old-fashioned dairy farm from a century ago, you'd see a farmer and his family, small plot of land, a small number of cows milked, sent to a dairy. There's no need for 
HR. There's no need for marketing. There's no need for um, payroll. There's no, you know, you don't have those functions on a, in a small firm. But all of a sudden, if you go to a modern dairy, you're going to find a massive operation in multiple locations. And that kind of dairy does need accounting. It does need management. It does need someone to do the payroll. It does need marketing services. So with larger firms, you have more need for headquarters. And headquarters um, increases the demand for larger buildings in urban areas. The third effect is that lower interest rates in terms of causing these taller buildings, these record-setting buildings, means that you need all kinds of new technology. You can't just use the old existing technology. Some, some things have to be invented brand new in order to make these record-setting skyscrapers work. Okay, so you need new kinds of elevators. So in recent years, um, with like the Bush Khalafi Tower, they have three-story elevators. So there's like three cabs, one on top of an, one another. So that when you, if you're going to the 67th floor, you get on a, in a special, a special elevator for that it's going to go to the um, 63rd, 64th, and 65th uh, story. So you've, you've got a new technology there. They've just recently invented a new uh, cable to pull the elevator up. If you use the old standard steel cable for the Burj Khalafi Tower, the cable itself would weigh 40,000 pounds. Okay, so that would obviously create an enormous need for a tremendous amount of power to get that cable up and down just itself. So they invented, somebody in Finland invented a new cable that only weighs about 2,000 pounds. Uh, the Japanese have invented a new form of air conditioner that doesn't require ductwork throughout the building. So for example, in this room right here, there's a large space between the ceiling and the next floor. I think it's about 18 to inches to two feet, and so, so that the ductwork can be run throughout the building. With the Japanese system, they don't need that. All they have is a little a hose that goes from room to room, and it brings the Freon itself, not cold air, not cold water, not um, hot air or hot, hot water, which is the traditional technology. They're just pumping the Freon from room to room so that there's no need for that space to run the ductwork. And of course, if you're talking about 200-story building and you have to run this much space just for the air conditioning system, obviously it's going to cost a lot more. So firms have to innovate. They have to produce new technologies ahead of their time, so to speak. And those new technologies require new factories, new delivery systems. Um, so the economy, in other words, is getting advanced technology, technology that otherwise wouldn't be needed because of these new taller buildings. And so we're not looking just at the skyscrapers themselves. We're looking at what's happening throughout the entire economy. Okay, this is um, some of the articles that I wrote uh, regarding the housing bubble. I started with... Um, Actually, I, I, I had one before that, uh, before the 2004 Mises Daily article. But um, I've been asked a lot of questions this week about the Austrian theory of the business cycle and can you know a bubble is out there? Can you know there's uh, trouble coming? And the scientific answer is that we cannot know for sure something is coming. But if you know Austrian theory of the business cycle, you can get, you can um, observe telltale signs and hints of what's coming uh, forth in the economy. And in early June of 2004, at the beginning of the week on Sunday, I went walking around my neighborhood 
and uh, a friend of mine, colleague of mine at Auburn University, owned a rental house on one of the streets that I walk on. And it had a uh, for sale sign and then sold on it. And I knew I was there the day before walking, and there was no for sale sign. So I was kind of curious. And I went to my colleague on Monday morning, and I said, you know, what's up with your house over there? He said, well, on Sunday, which is the day I went walking, uh, a friend of ours who was a real estate agent convinced us to sell the house. And by the end of the day, on Sunday, uh, they had three offers on the house, and it sold for above their asking price. So I knew that that's not – that's – atypical in real estate markets. You don't decide to put your house up for sale on a Sunday, get three offers, and sell it by Sunday evening. And then a couple days later, I was talking to my brother who had just become a, uh, an agent for a mortgage lending company in California. And he told me about his first day that um, he was able to uh, offer his clients new financing on their houses, give them a lower payment, and hand them over $50,000 of equity out of their houses. He said, Mark, it's too good to be true. And I said, you're darn right it is too good to be true. <laughs> uh, and that's when I started writing the article. Now, um, in 2010, early 2010, CNN contacted me about the opening of the Burj Khalafi Tower. And so I sent him my work on the subject, and uh, they pointed out that I wasn't surprised about the whole thing happening. And since then, there's been um, a pretty good amount of literature that's come out on the skyscraper curse trying to figure, figure it out by mainstream economists, as well as Austrian economists. Greg Kaza, who is a, uh, who's an Austrian economist um, and regularly publishes in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, he regularly comes to our research conference. Um, he did the skyscraper curse for the state of Arkansas and the state of Michigan. So Razorbacks is the team, team name for the University of Arkansas and Wolverines are the uh, team names for the University of Michigan. So he was doing Michigan and Arkansas, looking at the tallest buildings uh, in those states and comparing them to the business cycle, and he found a very good correlation between the two. Gunter Lufler um, looked at uh, skyscrapers and stock market returns. Uh, Jason Barr has written the most on this subject, uh, he's written several papers from a mainstream econometric perspective, uh, and he keeps on getting different answers um, using different data sets. Uh, he finds different reasons for the correlation between tower building and, um, and the economy. And I'll just highlight um, the last one that he did with a couple of colleagues, Mizrak and Munda, from... Rutgers University in uh, New Jersey. Their paper, Skyscraper Height and the Business Cycle, Separating Myth from Reality. That didn't sound too good. And indeed, he uh, basically attacks my 2005 paper and says that if you put the uh, skyscraper curse to an empirical test, that it turns out skyscrapers do not cause business cycles. Uh, they looked at announcement dates and opening dates, and those were not correlated with gross domestic product. Uh, so we turned, they turned their attention to uh, tall buildings in four countries and compared them with uh, re changes in real GDP per capita. And notice that none of these things, I mean, He's just looking at the, an ordinary business cycle, not economic crises type business cycles. And they, they found that using co-integration tests uh, that show that GDP and height are co-integrated and share a common pattern. 
Therefore, they conclude that height does not predict cycles. They move together with temporary deviations due to builder competition near the peaks in the business cycle. And Lucas's paper here on uh, why skyscrapers, a spatial economic approach, shows that lower interest rates increase land prices and wages. The higher opportunity cost of uh, commuting leads to taller buildings, and this supports my original paper in 2005. Uh, Barr and his colleagues seem to draw the most opposing stance against the curse because he first showed that record-setting skyscrapers were the result in part of psychological factors such as builder competition, social status, and ego. Second, he showed that the uh, date of the announcements and openings for record-setting skyscrapers does not fit the empirical pattern. And third, he shows empirically that skyscrapers do not curse or cause but that some third factor or factors cause both skyscrapers and curses. And then The Economist magazine, after reading Barr's paper, uh, decided that the skyscraper curse does not exist based on their evidence. Unfortunately, uh, their evidence actually supports the skyscraper curse. We would never think to suggest that building a skyscraper would cause an economic crisis in and of itself. As a matter of fact, I spend most of the paper in 2005 detailing that it's a, the third factor is interest rates that are causing both the building of world record setting skyscrapers and eventually an economic crisis. So apparently they didn't really read the paper um, in the first place, but we've had a devil of a time trying to correct this record because I sent a letter to the editor to The Economist and they didn't print it. Three months later, they wrote me and said that they had misplaced my letter to the editor. So why would you write somebody three months later to say that you had misplaced something? Sounds a little fishy, uh, but that didn't work, so Lucas and I sent a comment to the original journal where Barr's paper uh, first came out, and we said, you know, they've made a little mistake here, and here's why, and we, you know, drew out a very logical story about why they were wrong, uh, but the journal didn't want to print that either. It, I guess it would have made them look bad to publish a fundamentally flawed paper in the first place. And even The Economist, um, it's kind of surprising. They, they had this graphic produced and published in The Economist magazine. And, you know, they sided with Barr et al., that there is no skyscraper curse, and yet their graphic sort of lays it down for them. And The Economist had actually looked on the skyscraper curse favorably until they read this paper by Barr uh, and his two colleagues. So essentially that's where we stand today, is I think the evidence is pretty clear that record-setting skyscrapers correlate very well with large boom-bust periods that end up in economic crises. And we're also at the point where we're uh, living in an economy where yet another world record skyscraper is being built. Uh, right now, I think it's, it's probably up to about 60 or 70 stories high right now. Uh, so it's, it's in the works. There's nothing to say that it's going to actually be uh, a world record-setting skyscraper because Saudi Arabia is in terrible shape right now. Uh, they have, they're at war. They have terrorist problems. They have domestic problems. Their economy is, is not in good shape. It never was very particularly productive outside of pumping oil uh, and gas out of the ground. And even that's kind of troublesome because of the fall in the price of, 
of oil and gas. When that project was started in Saudi Arabia, the price of oil was well over $100 a barrel, and today it's down close to $40 a barrel. So there's nothing to guarantee that it's going to be built to a record-setting uh, height, uh, but that's what is in the works. Okay, well, I'll take some questions here, if you have any. Yes, sir. Yeah, in fa as a matter of fact, when I said I was getting lots of questions about the business cycle, actually, he gave them all to me, so. <laughs> Well, spurious correlation just means that they, they just happen randomly and there's nothing connecting them. And um, that's w the main reason why nobody really took uh, Mr. Lawrence's skyscraper index very seriously because most of these financial indicators that you might hear about um, do not really fundamentally determine the, the economy of the stock market. Um, there's things like the January effect where if stocks are up in January, then they'll be up for the year. Um, and for a while, that held pretty much true in a large majority of the cases, but there's nothing real about that. And, um, and we expect that those kind of indicators peter out over time. Uh, the, the Super Bowl index, another spurious indicator, when they discovered it, when it was discovered by financial journalists in the late 1970s, it was almost perfect that if a NFL team, NFC team won, then it'd be a good market, a uh, good year in the stock market. If the AFC team won the Super Bowl, it would be a bad year in the economy. So, you know, you've got to be skeptical of the skyscraper indicator because so many of these other indicators just never made people money consistently. Um, and so that's a possibility, but I think the, the connections of interest rates to what, how it transforms the economy, those are very well established connections in uh, the fields of finance and real estate um, and uh, mergers and acquisitions. Um, so those are all pretty straightforward uh, causal factors that play a role in this model. Now, um, I have gone back into the 19th century and have shown that earlier record-setting skyscrapers uh, also coincided with business panics, economic crises, um, and those kind of things. So we've actually been able to take the uh, skyscraper indicator which started with the Panic of 1907, the Depression, the stagflation of the 1970s, and uh, the Asian financial crisis. And we've been able to bring it forward in time to more recent records. We've corrected the record on the Woolworth Building, and we've gone back into the 19th, uh, late 19th century and found other correlations. So the, the number of skyscraper curse events has actually increased, and we haven't been running into the same sort of problem like the Super Bowl um, has, where its reliability continues to go down over time. But, you know, th the randomness of building a world record-setting skyscraper, uh, I think it makes you uneasy about these sort of things, because it's not a mechanical thing. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's more of a unique, these are more like unique independent events. Yes, sir. Uh, well, with, uh, New York uh, rebuilding or doing the uh, Freedom Tower, do you think 
based upon uh, your research that that could possibly happen, the crash or business? Well, the, the, yeah, the Freedom Tower, or I think it's called just simply the World Trade Center now, um, uh, set a new record in North America. Um, but in order to get the record for North America, they included a 400-foot uh, television transmission tower on top of it. And that's not livable space. It doesn't require any new technology. And so I never expected uh, the, the Freedom Tower, as it was called back then, to ignite uh, a world economic crisis because it wasn't a genuine world record. Um, yes, sir. So it, it looked like there were a couple aspects to what you said. Obviously, there's, there's the, the specific world record super skyscrapers, but then we're also talking about sort of more local level, we've got five levels to our, our building instead of you know, two or three is typical. Um, you think it'd be possible to just expand this argument out? I mean, as long as it's just world record skyscrapers, there's always going to be some skepticism of, well, you know, maybe you're kind of getting lucky. But if you can expand that to a large phenomenon, you say, no, wherever there's low interest rates, buildings increase by any number. Or something like that. Do you, do you think there's future? There's there's the future way to sort of expand this argument out just building in general. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think Greg Kaz's work on at the state level is a good example of that, and I think uh, we've seen a number of continental records like the Shard uh, coincide with more localized economic crises. Um, so within a nation, within a state, within a um, within a continent, you're likely to see record buildings and more localized economic troubles. Um, and also, you know, people have speculated, well, how about corporate headquarters? When some company like the Singer sewing machine decided to build their headquarters, um, you know, it's usually grand and lavish, um, during these periods. So like right now, Apple, Google, and Facebook are all building enormous and elaborate headquarters out in Silicon Valley. And so that would suggest to me, based on this kind of anecdotal evidence, that we're in for, between now and a couple of years, in for a major problem in that area of the stock market or that area of the economy right now as they're building these elaborate uh, headquarters. Uh, Google and Apple and Facebook have been uh, at record high stock prices, record revenue. Um, I just read yesterday that Apple has $181 billion in cash in overseas banks, $181 billion in cash outside the US banking system. And it's not a loan, it's just the, the company with the most cash um, in that form. So I, I, think it does, I think it does bleed over into things other than just world record setting skyscrapers. So it's a good, good question. Uh, we're talking about a curse, which is uh, obviously uh, a metaphor, and uh, how it uh, can be combined with our uh, praxeological framework, because we believe there is no um, historical loss. So uh, how would you um, uh, replace the word curse with uh, some, other, some other word to uh, explain it in terms of, of science, scientific reason? That's a great question. Um, Andrew Lawrence used the word curse because he couldn't figure out the real connection between one and the other. So it, he left it in kind of a mystical fashion, curse. 
like a witch doctor can curse you. Okay. And uh, I haven't come up with um, anything specific um, other than, you know, referring to the skyscraper index as a historical data. And, uh, and the curse, you know, is an economic crisis. Um, do you have any suggestions? Uh, I think that we could say that uh, we observe uh, some, some kind of tendency, but it's not, it doesn't tell uh, us anything about the future, that it's not uh, always, maybe there are some other, there can be some other, uh, um, other causes. Uh, yeah, we, for example, normal economic development, e normal economic growth and development in the absence of artificial interest rates uh, would eventually get us to new records. But under normal economic times without any monetary stimulus, uh, businesses don't find it attractive to build new records because of the requirements, uh, it gets more and more costly as you go higher. And all of a sudden, if your input suppliers are not coming up with innovations, then it's it's very expensive to build taller. Yes? So what you're saying about your brother with real estate going crazy, and then that's how you kind of knew in 2004 and 5 that this was going to happen. Um, my brother's girlfriend is a real estate market uh, person. And cannot hold on to property right now in northern New Jersey. Um, so if property values are at an all-time high, and they're regularly high because of this, and you're saying the new tower in Saudi is going to be 2017, 2018 completion, but 2020 opening, is 2017 the prime time to get rid of your property to get the highest return, or what would, like before it takes a big dip, or will it be 2018, 2020? Well, you know, I, I, I don't really know, obviously. Um, and that's one of the things that Austrian theory makes us well aware of, is that we, we cannot know such things uh, with certainty. We can't know that we're in a bubble. Uh, we can be pretty clear that we're in a bubble, but we can't know it. And uh, I remember very vividly in, uh, from June of 2004, uh, for the next couple of years, people were asking me, what do I do? I mean, it, total strangers would call up and, and say, you know, um, my wife is desperate to get into a house with, you know, enough room for washer and dryer. And, she, and he's talking real low on the phone like someone's might <laughs> might hear him. And I'm like, you know, what can I tell you? I mean, I can't tell you when it's going to go down, how much it's going to go down, uh, if it's going to go down. There are a lot of factors which might mitigate the ultimate effect um, and I would say, you know, real estate uh, is continuing to go higher right now in most markets, and um, there's not a lot of reports at all that real estate is slowing down or going down uh, throughout the economy. So it doesn't look like it's eminent, which is a good thing because I'm working on a book on all this stuff, and it's not done yet. <laughs> um but I'm work, working feverishly um, on this book. It's going to be called uh, The Skyscraper Curse and Why Austrian Economists Have Been Getting the Business Cycle Right for One Century. Might have to shorten that title a little bit, but that's my working title. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention.